Okay, good fruit. You guys ready for part two? Okay, part two. We are in part two of good fruit, and today's message is called pruned for more, okay? I need a volunteer up here, and if you could stick out your fingers. I'm kidding. Okay, we're not gonna actually do that yet. We'll do that later. Okay. Um, we're pruned for more. That's what we're talking about today. Um, who in here likes sports movies? Anybody? Okay, um, if you like sports movies, maybe I can just call on a couple people. What, what's your very favorite sports movie? If you, you're like, this is my favorite one. Andre, what's your favorite sports movie? Shout it out. Remember the Titans. That's a great one, right? Okay, yeah. Who, who else? Favorite? Julia. The Blind Side. Ooh, that's a classic. Rudy. Oh, that's really a classic. Another favorite movie? Moneyball. Okay, yeah, Moneyball is... I am third. Okay, interesting. I haven't seen that one. Okay, Moneyball. Okay, Bull Durham. Okay, there we go. Um, Rocky. Okay, yeah, there has to be one man in the building, right? <laughs> Field of Dreams. <sighs> American right there. Americana. They, all these sports movies, um, it, it's interesting. There are three things that you have to have in a sports movie, if you guys know this. There are three things you have to have in a sports movie. The first one is you have to have a major tension or conflict, it's like in the team, or, or if it's an individual player like in Rocky, it's like somebody, there's, there's this mental block or something that's stopping them. There's this big tension, this conflict that's frustrating them and they can't succeed because of it, right? So you got the conflict, that's the first thing. The second thing every sports movie has is a coach. There's either a coach or some kind of mentor figure or a guide who steps in and because of what they say and what they say, sometimes it's a friend, and what they say and help that hero or the team, then they can actually make it forward because that coach puts them through some hard stuff. Either they have to look internally or they need to get back to the basics, right? Like in Miracle, it's time to go just skate back and forth, hit those again and again, go up and down the ice over and over. And then there's, there's a third component. Do you guys know what it is? A montage. If you want a good sports movie, you need a good montage where all of the training, all the hard work, it gets condensed into this tiny little scene where you show them working hard, fighting, punching cows, whatever it takes, right? Because they're gonna do all that it takes to win, right? So you need those three things. Now let me tell you about life. Let me tell you about life. There is conflict in our life. There are struggles, sometimes many struggles, right? Things get hard and you're like, how can I succeed with this struggle? I don't know if I can make it through. So there's that. The second thing, there are, there is a coach. We have a coach in heaven. I think that's what Jesus taught us to pray, right? Our coach in heaven who leads us and guides us in our life and he tells us how we can get through some of the hardest things and it will be difficult, it will be challenging, but he teaches us how to do it. Will we listen or not? That's the question, right? But let me tell you the third thing. There are no montages in life. All that training that's hard and difficult, grueling sweat out in the hot, hot sun, it, you actually have to feel every single moment of it. There is no way to condense the hard stuff in life. You guys tracking with me? And that's what we're talking about today when we're talking about pruning, because there will be hard things, and it would be awesome if we could just take all the hard stuff we have to go through and condense it, the time of grief, the time of going through suffering and trial, going through a divorce, whatever it is and you in your life, and you're like, man, I wish I could just get it in on montage, right? and move on, but, but it doesn't work that way. We actually have to go through it. But when we go through it, on the other side, if we allow God to be our guide, then there's some incredible fruit that is produced in our lives. And that's what we're gonna learn about today in part two of our series, Good Fruit. Now, if you missed part one, that's okay. You can always go back to arisedenver.com slash media, find our audio, find our video, find transcripts of every message, subscribe on, on YouTube, subscribe on your phone for your podcast app, whatever you use, Spotify, get us on there. Uh, but we're gonna jump in today because last week we learned that God does want us to bear good fruit. He wants good things in our lives and that's why he wants not a transaction, but a relationship. That was our big idea last week. God doesn't want a transaction. He's not just like, come work for me. I need you to do this labor. And once you do those things and you give away your money, then I'm, then I'm gonna be good. So a lot of us come to God and we're like, hey, um, God, I'll do this for you if you do this for me, a transaction. But God's like, no, I want something better. I sent my son Jesus so you can have a real relationship with me. And from that relationship, fruit is ultimately produced. It's not because we're doing these things to be accepted by God. Instead, we are accepted by God and therefore we do these things because we're in a relationship with him. So that's what we learned last week, but today what we're gonna learn is that God prunes, he prunes us because he wants more for you. He prunes you because he wants more for you. 
He's going to allow and sometimes deliberately allow some difficult things in your life to happen because he wants more for you. Not from you, but for you. This is really important. The scriptures say that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. God created the entire universe. He doesn't actually need anything from you, but he wants something for you. And he wants to produce something really good in your life, that good fruit would be born, that you would be changed, and that you could do good works, yes, because he wants more for you, because he loves you. And that's what we're gonna see today as we open up our passage today, again, John chapter 15. So if you have a Bible, open with me to John 15. If you have a smartphone, use the YouVersion Bible app and then find our Rise Church Denver event right there on your phone. Uh, we're covering this passage, John 15, verses one to 17 over the next few weeks. It's gonna be a four-week series. This is week two. We're gonna start in verses one and two again, so we kind of recap from last week, get the, the main point, and then we're gonna focus on verses five through eight today. So let's look at verse one of John chapter 15 together. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. See where that word prunes comes from? In case you're wondering, I teach you guys from the Bible. That's what we do here. We believe in transformational teaching. We teach God's word accurately and relevantly to transform lives. That's what we do. So you saw the word prune in there. Now, now you see at first what you expect. If a branch doesn't bear fruit, God's like, what's the point of having this fruit? I'm gonna cut it off. Got that? But what's interesting is he says, there's other branches that do bear fruit. And what does he do to those? He prunes. That was the same action, wasn't it? Did you see that? How's that? Okay, that leaf didn't look good, right? Let's take that off. Why do I point that out? If our father in heaven is the gardener and he's going around pruning, he might not have had these nice telescoping um, pruners back in the day, but he would have had maybe a knife or some kind of blade, the gardener, and they would have used the same tool to both cut off branches that are worthless and will be thrown away and burned, to also prune the good branches so that they will be more fruitful. Tracking with me? It's the same tool. Meaning God will use things in our lives that are hard, that hurt, that might even look a little violent from the right angle, right? If your finger was up there, that's very violent, okay? We're talking horror movie territory. But the intention of the gardener is really important in this, right? And I say this because God will allow and sometimes deliberately allow, uh, I would say maybe everything he deliberately allows to happen to us are hard, their difficulty, their trials. It feels like suffering. Sometimes it feels literally like something's getting cut off. But he's doing that if he loves you so that you can bear more fruit because he wants something more for you. You guys understand? Maybe you've seen this. I know people that I have spent time with as a pastor. I get to, to talk with people in some of their best moments and also some of their worst moments. And I remember sitting down with one man who had uh, rejected God early in life, lived his own life the way he wanted, but then when he was older, he got diagnosed with terminal cancer. And that very night, he fell on his knees, cried out to God, and accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And for the rest of his life, he followed Jesus, wanted to learn and grow, and it changed him. He was a different person. And I remember sitting with him after this terminal diagnosis, and his life had transformed. But I also know people who have gotten a cancer diagnosis and turned away from God, become angry and bitter all the time for the rest of their lives. You know what I'm talking about? Same tool, and yet it changes one person to bear more fruit, and they actually can become happier on the other side and others to become more bitter and angry. Same, same tool, same event. You sometimes see this in a marriage where one person is changed and developed through something and the other person gets angry. It can lead to a lot of divorces. One situation. One couple uh, goes through infertility and they get angry, depressed, walk away from the faith and another one, their faith is bolstered, bolstered and stronger than ever before. 
The same tool can change one way or the other. So the question is, how will you respond to the pruning of God? It's not gonna be pleasant. It's not gonna feel good. And yet, if you realize and recognize the bigger picture of what God is doing in your life, you will be very grateful on the other side. It won't feel good in the moment, but you'll realize he's actually producing something better in you, joy, happiness, contentedness with your situation, if you allow him to prune you. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying right now. Somebody asked me that this week, another a fellow pastor was like, Matt, when things are really hard and you have to make challenging decisions, how do you even enjoy being a pastor? And I remember this, I'm like, yeah, I've been through some tough stuff where I'm like, man, maybe I should quit. But now I'm like, actually, when you go through the hardest things, you realize this will make me better on the other side and will help our church get even stronger on the other side. So we've gotta realize it's the same tool that can be used either way and it's up to us how we respond to that pruning how we respond. Let's uh, jump now into verse five. I want you to jump down with me. Uh, In verse five, we're gonna learn three different points about um, how God wants to produce more in your life. And the first thing we learn, let's actually give the point before we read the verse. Point number one, thanks Jeff, is that God does, his pruning produces more. So that's our first point. God's pruning produces more. So in verse five, Jesus says this. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So you can bear much fruit, more fruit, if you remain in Jesus, even through the pruning. You guys get that? Stay in relationship with him through the hard things. And then verse six says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So he's just reiterating what he had already said, right? I'm the vine, you are are the branches. Okay, we are all branches connected to Jesus in relationship. And when we go through that pruning season, that difficulty, if we stay in connection, in relationship with him, even when it's hard, then we'll bear even more fruit on the other side. But if we don't, we'll be thrown away into the fire. So that's why God's pruning is to produce more in us, through us, for us. Now, um, I didn't know this. Maybe some of you guys are amateur um, gardeners like me. And I remember the first time I planted a tomato vine in Nebraska where it actually could grow, unlike here in Colorado. Man, it was like easy. You throw a seed out there, like James and the giant peach happened, right? Okay, that's what happened in Nebraska with the good soil. That's why it's the breadbasket of our country, right? That's where we get all our food. Um, but when I planted, like, the first thing, like, this, this vine was spreading everywhere. You had to, like, put, put it up on something because it was just growing everywhere and all over the ground. And, and it was starting to get a bunch of little tomatoes. And I was excited. Hey, all these tomatoes. And, and I remember at the end of that season, the first harvest of my first tomato plant, we had hundreds and thousands of these tomatoes. And they were all little small ones. And I remember people in our church would bring their extra produce from their gardens to church every week and you could take whatever you wanted. Like that was the Midwest, that was awesome. And, and there was always way too much and you had to lock your doors or else you'd get a bunch of squash put in the seat. Like I'm, not, I'm kidding, this is what happened. Like I don't want more zucchini. Um, but, but like everybody else's tomatoes were huge and ripe and beautiful and I was like, well, what happened? And I remember one of the women in my church were like, well, you have to prune all those other branches, right? You gotta pr- prune the vine. I was like, what? Like, but it had fruit on it. It was, it was growing tomatoes. But the point is, if you want it to be actually more fruitful and produce better fruit, you have to prune it. You have to take away vines that are even producing good things. You for sure you need to take away the bad ones that are taking nothing, they're just sucking the nutrients out and no fruit are coming off. Like cut the bad stuff out. But you also have to cut out some good stuff. And I think that's what God does in our life. He wants to cut out all the bad stuff. He wants to get rid of your sin, your addictions that are just dragging you down. He wants to get rid of your depression and your anxiety. He wants to cut out all the bad stuff. Sometimes there's some bad relationships in your life that God's like, it's time to change that relationship in your life. You gotta move out. We gotta cut that out because I want something better for you. He does. And and we get that. We're like, okay, that makes sense. But sometimes God also cuts out some seemingly good stuff because he wants something even better for us because it will produce even more in the end. You guys tracking with me on this? 
God has gifted every single one of us. If we are a believer in Jesus Christ, if we follow after him, he's given us special gifts. And I think that's an important way because it's like you can do anything in your life, but there are certain things that if you do will produce more fruit. Do you recognize this? Do you know how I got started in ministry? I was a worship leader. Guess what I'm not doing anymore? Hey, you don't want me up here. Like I was doing it. I was good, but let me tell you, Sam does it a thousand times better than I could ever do. Yeah, Sam's just starting the applause for that. Diego, thank you, Diego, for leading us this morning. Can, can do it a thousand times better than I could ever do. Well, let's throw Sam up here preaching here in a couple of weeks, see how he does. <laughs> I'm kidding, okay. But you, you can do a bunch of good things or you can do the best things in your life. And I'm telling you, God wants to remove the bad stuff, but he also wants to remove some seemingly good stuff because he has something even better for you. And it's really hard in the pruning process to see that. You loved that person, and now the relationship is gone. How could God give me anything better? Oh, but he can. Oh, but he can. And some of you right now are being pruned, and you're feeling it. It does not feel good right now, but let me tell you, God has something better in store for you. He sees the other side and says, I can't wait till you see what I see. To experience what I have for you in the future because it's far better than what you're experiencing right now. Just wait. And somebody needs to hear that today. Maybe you're online and you need to hear that. I'm telling you, God has a good plan for you. He works in all things, even the worst things, the bad things, the divorce things, the cancer things, the suffering things, in all things for the good of those who love him. For the good of those who love him. He's got good fruit for you. You've got to trust him through that. J.I. Packer, the great theologian, once said that God uses even chronic pain and weakness along with other afflictions as his chisel for sculpting our lives. He's sculpting us. He's pruning us. Some of those things go on and on. He's developing something in you. and He's changing you for good fruit. So that's our first point. God's pruning produces fruit. And what's interesting is in this pruning process, Jesus is gonna kind of, it seems like he's almost ch- ch- changing uh, subjects here as we go into verse seven. But really, I think it's what happens in that process. If you're staying connected to him in relationship, what's going to happen is you're going to develop a stronger relationship with God through Jesus. And that's why the second thing that we learn for God to produce more is that relational prayer produces more. Relational prayer as you're in some of the toughest spots, you're crying out to God, you're angry with God, and you're talking to him. How could you do this? I'm waiting, where's the response? How could you allow this to happen? And that relationship is growing as you're talking to him and he's speaking back to you. Jesus says this in John 15, seven. Right after he talks about that pruning process, he says, if you remain in me in relationship and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Ask means prayer. A lot of us like that, we're like, we just wanna take that second half of the verse and memorize that and keep that. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That sounds good, right? Name it, claim it. Like, let's go. Go to my prayer list. And we should have a prayer list. I have an ongoing prayer list. I add stuff to it. Some of you guys ask me to put it on. I'll put it on my prayer list. I got an app now that reminds me because I got a bad memory, but my, my app will tell me to pray for you. I'll do it. I'm praying for some Huge things, some little things, some outlandish things, and I got a big list. And when we ask these things, Jesus tells us that there's an if. Your prayers will be answered if. Okay, we should really study this first, right? If you do this, your prayers will be answered. That sounds good. What does it say? If you remain in me and my words remain in you. Jesus is saying is if you have a relationship with me, so you're staying in relationship, abiding in relationship, And my words, meaning Jesus' teaching, what he wants for you remain in you. Then you're gonna ask for things and your prayers will be answered. That sounds incredible, doesn't it? There's a relational component of this. One of the disciples, John, would write a little bit later in 1 John 5, 14. He would say, this is the confidence we have in our relationship with God. If we ask for anything, what? What? In agreement with his will, he listens to us. In verse 15, if we know that he listens to whatever we ask, we know that we have received what we asked from him. If we know his will, if we know what he wants, we can ask him for it and we'll get it. In the Psalms, it said, delight yourself in the Lord and the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. 
See, when you're in a relationship with someone, you start to know them a little bit better. And then a lot better. And then you're gonna ask them for stuff and you know what the answer is even before you ask. The longer I've known Melissa, yes, there are things that I'm like, I still don't understand her at all. And I probably never will figure out the woman completely. But I'm learning a lot more. Now, now I know sometimes what restaurant she wants to go to before I even ask, right? I know what she's gonna order on the menu before we even get there. And I know when not to ask <laughs> to go to a restaurant, right? When you get to know someone better, you know them better. Some kids, like the, the longer you, you're with your parents, you're like, I don't even need to ask permission to do this thing. I know they're gonna say no. <laughs> or I know they'll say yes to this, right? Same thing with our Father in heaven. We get to know him better. We get to know Jesus better. And we're gonna start asking for things that line up with his will. I have a friend, Nathan, who, who graduated with me in seminary. And, and he and his wife were, were living in Littleton, but they wanted to start a brand new church in Englewood, Colorado. Right? You know, and they were trying to do it. And they were like, we wanna be right in the city, um, but we can't afford it. How are we gonna do it? So they... And they said, we also have another calling on their life. So, so God called them to plant a church and he also called them to foster kids. So they're like, we need a house, but we need a big house. <laughs> they're like, so they started asking God for a house with at least four bedrooms because that's what they wanted. That was, that was their desire. But they had listened to God so much they knew that that was God's desire for them that within a few weeks, they had the house that they wanted. And I love his story that he shared and now their church is doing awesome. He's doing great stuff in Englewood um, with both foster care and planting a church. And it's because when you're like, what do you want for me to do, God? And you start searching in his word for what he has to teach you and you're following Jesus, you're like, you're gonna know what he wants before you ask. And then you can ask even bolder. You're like, well, you know, you want this. So can I have like four bedrooms? Cause I wanna have more. <laughs> I wanna have a big living room so I can have people over and love them and have a good community group in my house this fall. Okay, you guys can pray for that cause we need some more community group leaders. And you'll be amazed that God will come through with prayers like that because you're praying in alignment with his will for you. And if his will is there, you're gonna be asking for it. And, and yes, keep asking for things because sometimes we don't know. There are the revealed, there's the revealed will of God and there's also the secret will of God. We don't know all the secret things, but let's claim the revealed ones. And then the more and more we get to know him in relationship, we're gonna line up, right? And it's this kind of give and take of relationship and the more and more you work and develop that relationship through prayer, talking with God, opening up God's word. Whenever I read uh, my Bible in the morning, I, I always read until it leads me into prayer. I read a verse. If it's about sickness, I'm like, well, I got about five people who I know who are sick right now. You start praying for those five people. Let God's word, let Jesus' word lead you into that relationship. You see, if, if his words remain in you and you remain in him, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That's what Jesus promises. So man, some of you guys need to get in your Bible if you want your prayers answered. You need your prayers to get your prayers answered. Tim Keller, the late, great Tim Keller, said, if you say, I believed in God, I trusted God, and he didn't come through, you only trusted God to meet your agenda. Hmm. But in this relational prayer, he wants your prayers to be answered. That's why he wants to be in a relationship with you. And for you to see the good things that he has for you. He wants to produce more in you, through you, for you. So stay in relation. And that relational prayer produces more. That's the second thing. But the third point, you guys gotta get this. You gotta understand God's heart. And it's that relation, I'm sorry, the third point is that the relationship produces more. The relationship produces more. The more and more that relationship grows, God actually wants more for you. He's not okay with the way things are in your life. He's not okay with the bad situation. He's not even okay with the good situation where you're like, oh, my bank account's fine, my investments are doing good, I have a job, my kids are healthy. He's not even okay with that. He wants more for you. And the relationship with him will produce more. And that's how Jesus finishes out this section. In verse eight, Jesus said, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. He wants more, he wants much fruit in your life. It's more and abundant, it's, it's the best fruit. That's what God wants for you and our Father in heaven is glorified, he's magnified. You know, we, when we have a hero in our culture that does something great, saves somebody from a burning building, we're like, we applaud them, right? It's to their glory. How much more so the God of the universe who sent his own son to die for you on your behalf. He deserves glory. He deserves honor and he is honored and glorified and he's smiling when we bear fruit in our lives. 
when good things are produced in us, through us, and for us. Do you understand that? You should if you're a parent. Okay, my twins are, are three and a half, McKinley's six and a half, and they are deep into swim lessons this summer, right? They're going every week to swim lessons. And every Friday, since that's my day off, I get to go swimming with them. And this, every week now, because they're in swim lessons, they're practicing some new stuff, right? On Friday, what do they do? Dad, look at this. Dad, look at this. Dad, you gotta see me. Daddy, daddy, daddy. Right, every single, and then I'm like, okay, yes. I, I know, ex- you guys get this. I know exactly what it looks like for a kid to dive underwater. I know how to jump off the side of the pool into the water, okay? I, I know. But do you think I'm frustrated? Like, I am so happy. Yeah, that is so cool. You're doing amazing. Let's go jump again. And they jump again and again and again into the water. And it's hard with two, okay? We got a thing we call the twin tax because if one gets it, the other one has to get it too. So you can't just throw one kid in the water. You gotta throw two kids in the water. And then my back's like, okay, right? That's a twin tax, okay? But, but I love it because they're showing me new things. It's not that I have never seen someone dive underwater. It's not that I don't know how to dive underwater. I know that I could dive underwater myself. That's not the point. I take joy in seeing my children do great things. Grow up, be happy, and I'm happy. Now, I'm gonna love them the same no matter what. But when they do those things, I'm even happier, right? I think that's how our Father in heaven is. He doesn't need us to do anything. He's not asking us to do things because then we'll be accepted by him and loved by him. Okay, he loves us and accepts us unconditionally And therefore, he is happy when we do stuff. When we're changed to be more like his son, Jesus. When we produce good fruit and when we're generous in serving others, he has an even bigger smile on his face. Now he's gonna love you unconditionally. And yet he's gonna be even happier, more glorified when you bear more fruit. So that's what God wants for you. Do you understand this? He wants more for you. Um, Now, I need uh, help from somebody in the audience. So who's gonna be my bold volunteer today? Taylor. Taylor's just looking straight at me. You're supposed to avert your eyes. Didn't you learn that in school? Okay. Yeah, come over, stand right here so everybody can see you. Can we welcome Taylor to the stage? Thank you, Taylor. Okay, and then hold this because everybody has a phone in their hand right now, right? Okay, so you gotta keep that in your hand. Now I want you to come and take as much fruit as you can. And, and you gotta hold it. No, you, you gotta grab it with your hand. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's see how, many, how much he can get, right? Hey, in the pockets. Look at that. Okay, he's stealing fruit now. Just keep it in your hands. Okay, that's good. Okay, whoa, you dropped one. Let's go. Okay, so how, how much fruit do you have? Six plus one, he stole in his pocket, breaking the rules. Okay. Okay, now give me that phone. Okay, now, now this is what you're supposed to do, okay. Okay, how many, how many do you have now? Okay, yeah, a lot more, right? See, and here's the thing, like when your hands are full, you try to cheat a little bit, but um, when your hands are full uh, of stuff in your life, it's hard to hold what God has for you. But when you let go even good things, there's even more that you can hold, right? Okay, can we give Taylor a, a round of applause? And give me back that one in your pocket. Let's, come on. Second service needs it. Oh, there's two in your pocket. Look at that. Anybody want some citrus? Who's the Bull Durham fan? Who shouted Bull Durham? Yeah, there we go. Okay. He's ready for that. Okay. So here's the thing. God wants more for you. And he wants to bear much fruit, good fruit, the best fruit in your life. So some of you just have your hands too full of, of stuff that you think is good. Maybe it's sin that you need to get rid of, bad stuff, but maybe it's some, some decent stuff in your life that God is trying to prune away because he has much, and, and he's got way more than this. He wants to, to, to create in you. God wants more for you. He wants more to be produced in you. It's not that he needs you to bear fruit. All the fruit is his. He's the one creating the fruit, but he wants it for you because he loves you. And if you're like, well, but Matt, some of the things you've talked about, suffering, divorce, cancer, infertility, hardship, like that is so bad. How could we even know that God is good? Well, let me tell you this. Our good, good father sent his own son. 
And he, if he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give us all things? That's what Romans 8.32 says. We have a father in heaven who is willing to let his own son suffer, struggle, go through trials, go on the cross to be mocked, humiliated, abused, and then suffer and die on our behalf because God knew that was the only way that he could atone for the sins of the world. And if God is going to do that, to allow his own son to be pruned, he's going to allow you to be pruned too because he wants something better for you. And that's why we trust in Jesus, we follow Jesus, because it's in that relationship we'll bear more fruit. And as John, Jesus said just a few chapters earlier in John, John 10, 10, Jesus says this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. That's what he wants for you, the full life. And that's why God prunes, because he wants more for you. He wants more for you. Let's pray. Lord God, um, I hope that you would help us to trust you, to believe you through the hardship, through the trials, through the suffering. When we're feeling pruned, help us to trust you to know that you are making good fruit, that you are bearing something great in us, through us, and for us. Help us to trust you. And with eyes closed, I, I, I know there's some people in here right now who are struggling in a trial. You're feeling pruned right now. And if that's you, I wanna pray for you, a special prayer, just for those who are struggling right now. So people's eyes are closed, but if you're suffering, struggling, whatever the trial is you're going through, it hurts, I want you to raise your hand in the air right now because I'd like to just pray a special prayer for you. I see those hands. And Lord God, I pray for every single one of those that's bold enough to put their hand up. They say, I'm struggling, I'm in the hardship. I'm maybe, they're angry right now. Lord God, I pray that you would shine your light on them, that you would show them your love, that they would feel in this moment right now your blessing, your mercy, that they would know that in all things you're working for the good of those who love you, that they would see that you're pruning them for good fruit, for something good in their lives, and that you'd help them make it through this trial to get to the other side where there is fullness, where there's more fruit, that there's abundance. You can put those hands down. Now, I also wanna say, because there's some of you in here who are not yet followers of Jesus, and the promise that we have in the scriptures is that God will produce good fruit for those who love him. He'll work in all things for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And if you haven't made Jesus your Lord and savior, he's not gonna work all things out. In fact, you might be one of those branches that gets thrown off into the fire. And I don't want that for you. God doesn't want that for you. And if you want God to work in your life for the good, you've gotta accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So I'm gonna give you a, a simple prayer that you can repeat so that you can make that happen and you will receive forgiveness, new life now, and eternal life ahead. So with eyes closed, if you're already a follower of Jesus, say this prayer out loud to give courage to somebody next to you who needs to say this prayer for the first time. Now please repeat after me. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Save me, forgive me. In faith, I declare, Jesus is Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me to follow you and bear more fruit. Now with eyes closed, if you said that prayer for the first time and meant it, if Jesus today is your Lord and Savior, we wanna celebrate with you and we also have a special book we wrote that we wanna give you to help you in your next steps of faith. So please put your hand in the air on the count of three and we'll celebrate with you. One, two, three. Put your hand in the air if you made that decision. I see that hand in the back. Praise God. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate that decision. Um, Lord God, we're just so grateful for those who make a decision to follow you. And we pray that they would have an abundant relationship with you, that it would grow and bear fruit. And Lord God, for all of us, we want that. We want more. And we know you have more for us in your love. Help us walk into that. In Jesus' name.